we've got a big election. Why is Virginia an important state to look at? Just ge generically speaking, uh, you know, uh, why is Virginia an important state? Yeah, so um, Virginia is only one of two states that has state legislative elections this year, the other being New Jersey, though that's pretty safely in Democratic hands. But in Virginia, in 2019, Democrats flipped the House uh, of Delegates there by just 2,000 votes. Uh, if 2,000 votes had changed hands, they wouldn't have flipped the House of Delegates. Uh, they have a five-seat majority now. That shows you just how you know tight st these state legislative races are. Um, and so heading into 2020, for the first time in a very long time, Virginia had a legislative majority that was focused on improving people's lives. Um, and so if you look at kind of the things that we're arguing about right now in Washington, D.C., uh, in Virginia, they've accomplished a lot of them already. You talk, want to talk about voting rights? Uh, in Virginia, they passed automatic voter registration. They um, made it a lot easier to vote early or absentee. You want to talk about, um, you know, investing in children, you know, or having this fight about the child tax credit. You know, they, are, they expanded um, really school lunch and school breakfast programs. Um, you want to talk about prescription drug prices. They capped the price of insulin. So you're talking about this legislative majority that really has been working to improve people's lives. Um, and so you're heading into 2021 and you're in a different political climate where, you know, during when Trump was president, you saw voters really energized to oppose his brand of politics for coming out a lot more. Uh, since he lost, the people that are believing kind of the radical right wing's big lie about 2020, they are getting really energized too. And so if you look at Virginia, um, you know, it's a little nerve wracking because all of those people are coming out to vote while, you know, people who would support kind of, again, these, these candidates who are really improving people's lives, maybe a little complacent. So uh, we're really working hard to uh, energize those voters, get them out in, you know, these next four weeks uh, to vote in Virginia. And polls have things really tight. They have the gubernatorial candidate ahead slightly, but in Virginia, um, state legislative candidates tend to underperform the top of the ticket on the Democratic side. So it, it, it has been nerve wracking. The majority is at risk. I'm sorry. Did you say they, they tend to underperform or overperform? Underperform. Uh, you know, typically in Virginia, they've run a few points behind the gubernatorial nominee. And wasn't Virginia, uh, wasn't there, uh, uh, and just to add to sort of like, I mean, as we sort of tease out this dynamic of, of enthusiasm, wasn't Virginia one of the, um, wasn't there a county in Virginia where like a lot of the c critical race theory stuff was happening um, it, it down there? I mean, isn't there, or is, is that right? Or, or do I have that mistaken? No, you're correct. Uh, Loudoun County, which is, um, uh, you know, you and I remember the Bush era, all the former George W. Bush staffers moved to Loudoun County um, and they created kind of an astroturf movement to um, make this into a big issue. Um, but I think it kind of just shows how the radical right is really seizing on these non-issues to try to energize their voters. And you, you can see that there. You can see it with the big lie. Um, you know, if you look at the Republican candidates in Virginia, um, you, know, you have one person who is a member of the big lie legal team. He's running for the House of Delegates as a Republican. He's in a safe Republican seat. He's going to be in the House of Delegates next year, you know, almost certainly. And, you know, it's a real peril to democracy that, um, you know, th these kind of flim flammers might have a majority, might have subpoena power. So, I mean, has there been any, I, I think, reckoning with or understanding of how to activate negative partisanship going into this race in the way that perhaps Newsom did in the California recall. Now it's a little different because you can draw a direct connection with like, oh, we're going to be undemocratic here, just like the January Sixers were and just like the Trump administration is. But I would imagine there's a way to take some lessons from what happened in California a few weeks back. Yeah, and you know, I think one other parallel to California is that uh, Newsom was really aided by the fact that he made it easier for people to vote and so in Virginia, we're seeing, you know, it's easier to vote early, it's easier to vote absentee. So hopefully that'll help as well. In terms of activating negative partisanship, I think a big issue right now is similar to what uh, Newsom uh, had was uh, on vaccines. And, um, you know, the Democratic ticket in Virginia is supportive of, you know, vaccine mandates, especially for people like healthcare workers. And the Republican ticket is not. And, you know, so I think you're seeing that as well there. 
Um, I, you know, I think, you know, obviously, to the extent that, a, you know, a Republican candidate in a marginal area can be tied to Trump, um, you know, it harms them among uh, median voters, especially in a state like Virginia. But, you know, it also, our candidate, you know, people don't just want to hear Trump, Trump, Trump all the time. They want to have kind of a positive vision for the future. And thankfully in Virginia, you know, we have candidates who have been working to improve the lives of people in the Commonwealth. And it's just, they need to get that message out. I mean, that's really the, the issue right now that you're know, getting it through the din. You know, it, it's, it can be so hard to cut through kind of clutter coming out of DC, especially in a state like Virginia. So uh, that's the challenge right now. All right, I, I want to dig into this this dynamic because I am increasingly convinced that the that turnout is going to be a function of that negative partisanship. I mean, I I do think obviously you need to have uh, a, a positive vision, but I think that's just sort of like baseline. That's like basically like I need signatures to get on the ballot. Um, after that, um, there needs to be particularly from the center to the left. It seems to me. It is driven by by um, and I think it's the, the case on the on the right. But like you say, they always figure out what it is they're going to run against. And it's and, and, and more often than not, it's make believe. Right. I mean, it's yeah. going to be uh, you, you, you know, you got to get out there and vote because otherwise everybody's going to be they're going to be teaching our kindergartners critical race theory. And, and uh, you know, it. it, it it could have been they're going to be teaching our kindergartners, you know, trigonometry, <laughs> but black trigonometry or something. You know, it has to have like some uh, sort of racial component to it. But they will uh, they're getting their people out. And and I look at things like there was um, abortion protests around the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was barely on my radar. Um, and. I don't know how many ultimately there were I did, or how how big they were, but they were not they were not like the days after the Trump administration. And we're doing this in the wake of what's happening in Texas. We're doing this as uh, there are uh, a more like a, like a head on assault on uh, Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court. And yet and yet. Uh, we're, you know, we're not quite seeing that mobilization. How much of like the enthusiasm gap um, do you think is real? And, it, you know, what, what do you do to combat that? Yeah, no, um, I think there is a bit of an enthusiasm gap right now, just because uh, the radical right really is just so mobilized right now. But as you mentioned, you know, on health care, um, that, you know, that is an issue where we just saw the Supreme Court basically overturned Roe v. Wade. It's now, and you know what that means is that it now falls to state legislatures to protect uh, women's health care. In Virginia, in 2020, the legislative majority passed the Women's Health Act, uh, protecting that right. Uh, meanwhile, on the members of the Republican statewide ticket in Virginia this year are saying that they wanted, they want to have a law similar to Texas. So, you know, it's a stark choice there. And so, um, if you can return, you know, kind of pro women's health legislators to Richmond, you can continue protecting women's health care in that way. And there has been mobilization around that. I mean, I think comparing it to the women's march is a bit of a high bar. Right. But right. The fact that you were able to get a lot of people out and mobilize. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the state, they know the stakes. We're getting everyone on board. You know, I think, and there's a lot to be excited about here. And it's not, you know, in, in the, again, in the healthcare realm, it's not just that. It's also, you know, again, capping the price of insulin. They're really focusing on making it so that Virginians can get the health care that they need. And so um, there is mobilization around that there. I think, you know, Trump, I, as you mentioned, kind of hangs over everything. I think, yes, that is a way to uh, have that negative uh, partisanship mobilization, which is really important, as you said. But it can't just be that. You can't let that overwhelm your message. And so it's a, it's a delicate balance. But, you know, again, we have all these great issues to get people excited on because of all the great work that they've done. And it's just getting that message out there. That's the key. How much does the the anti-vaccine uh, mandates and anti-masking, how much does that come into play? Because I know on one hand it motivates, and we have a piece right here um, the the other day about the uh, Koch brothers, or I guess not the not the brothers anymore, but uh, uh, the, the Koch Coke, network. The Coke network um, uh, you know, funding a lot of this anti-mask, anti-vaccine stuff 
because they see it as something, you know, that motivates people to go out and vote. Um, it just gets them angry and they go out and vote. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> what do you got going on there? So you, so you're kidding. I'm on a vacuuming. So. Oh, that's uh, right. yeah, no, okay. Um, 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 I mean, how, how much is McAuliffe like running against that? How much are the assembly, you know, the, the, uh, uh, uh the assembly people or the delegates, delegates yes. rather, how much are they running against that? Like how much, how, how, how forefronted is that? Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously it's a big issue. It's the front of everyone's minds. I think actually at the start of the year, everyone thought that school openings would be a big issue. Like, um, you know, kind of radical, right. If you look at kind of what the Cokes were doing then, it wasn't so much masks and mandates. It was school openings. Well, Hey, guess what? Um, Virginia, you know, they had a, They've done a pretty good job vaccinating people. They're able to keep schools open. Um, and so they need a new kind of, uh, you know, boogeyman type issue uh, on their end. And so they're ter- and so they're trying to make masks and mandates that. Um, and again, you have, uh, you know, legislative majority in Virginia right now that supports basic public health measures. And I think this election will really be a test of, you know, can, you know, are, are, are the people who are just so motivated by hatred of basic public health measures, are there, you know, there, they might be a minority, but are they kind of just motivated enough to overwhelm people who do support them? Um, you know, again, it's really just comes down to, we really need to get kind of the sensible people to the polls there. Virginia. And, and are, are I mean, what, what is the next thing? Is it, is it going to be mask mandates and, and, and vaccines? Like, I mean, how are they? Cause I guess I'm asking not just for Virginia now, but, if if we get on the, stay on the same trajectory with um, with COVID and we don't have another variant, which who knows? Um, like what what are they going to lean on at that point? I mean, is it going to go back to CRT? It feels like the the, the critical race theories thing is sort of um, our our has you know run out like there's only so many times you can ban crt from your schools and it's sort of like you're i don't know um you're you're, you're just shadow boxing and at one point you just you tie yourself out with that because there's nobody hitting back there's nobody going like we need to have these critical race theories uh you know taught to our our, our third graders or we're gonna have to rewrite the books i mean what what where do you think they go from here I think it goes back to the animating fear behind all of this. And it is fear, you know, I think it's not just a fear, but really the knowledge that they have a very unpopular political program that is not supported by a majority of this country. Um, And so it's whipping their base into a fear of the fact that the majority of the country, you know, doesn't think like them. And it's really goes back to the big lie. And it goes back to actually the election was stolen. It goes back to, we need to do whatever possible to really, uh, fight representative democracy in this country. Um, and that's really, that's the end goal. Like they know they're not supporting a political program that a majority of people can support. What the, what they have to go, they have to go kind of just animate their base through fear, hoping that an anti-majoritarian system will allow them to stay in power because that will to power is the thing that binds them together right now. And so what we need to do, and and again, that effort to really undermine democracy runs through state legislatures. Uh, the Supreme Court has said as much. They have they are inventing a doctrine that, you know, basically might say in 2024, a state legislature can annul the uh, results of the presidential race in the state. Um, so state legislatures are going to be the key background, not just this in you know, the next month in Virginia, but in 2022 everywhere for protecting democracy, because the legislators who are sworn in in early 2023 are going to be the ones who could potentially uh, decide whether people's votes are going to count in 2024. I, I want to get in a little bit to, to the specific candidates that you guys have, you know, uh, are, are looking at. But do you think that on a national level, I mean, if it's the case, right, that they're going to push uh, the 2020 thing uh, and, 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 and it sure feels like that's what Donald Trump wants to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, very hard, even for the Republicans, it seems to me, to sort of like contain him. Does it make sense for the Democrats at that point, and and, th- and this can be both a specific question and a general question, to really push the January 6th hearings 
as a mechanism in which to forefront Trump? Because I really do think there's a, a unique opportunity for Democrats here and that they don't have to think too hard about who to run against in, in an off year election. Like generally, the reason why parties that are out of power do well in an off year election is because they can run against the party that is in power. And because the party in power is everybody's conscious of it, right? I mean, it's not like, um, uh, you know, Bill Clinton could run against uh, George Herbert Walker Bush in his midterm uh, after, you know, George, but, but really the Democrats could run against Trump to some extent in their midterm. And that's an opportunity they've never had before. And it seems to me, you know, Trump animates voters because you focus on state elections. How much does what the Democrats do on a national level, setting certain narratives, how much does that bring people out during a midterm election for those state elections or even the off or even 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 in november when we don't even have they're not with the federal elections no um you know the number one predictor of whether a state legislative candidate is going to win their seat is whether their party's presidential candidate carried the seat so you know the national you know elections across the country have been nationalized um and you know people are aware of that and again, you know, we are seeing these, you know, people who are involved with the big lie running for office at the state level, especially in state legislatures, who, again, are going to be the people determining that. So to the extent that we can make the assault on democracy like salient in people's minds, um, that is really you know, critical to putting that front and center um, in, in voters minds as well and making that threat. It's like, you know, democracy is on the ballot in Virginia next month everywhere in 2022 and you know again through you know specials and odd year elections you know basically um for a very for the foreseeable future um and so that you know we have to be mindful of that um and yeah so i mean again that is something that we all have to be very mindful of going forward <laughs>